a certain person could not understand what exactly is happening to him. He was not able to move his body. He sees a person standing beside him and wonders who she is. He checks his status and is amazed to see that he has no name and is at level 1 now. He wonders if he got reborn as a child. As he wonders where he is, he questions whether this beautiful woman is his mother as his mom is supposed to be this annoying old lady with a big mouth. A gentleman arrives and offers a kind comment on the baby's attractive facial features. Standing behind him, a woman remarks that the baby's mouth bears a striking resemblance to the gentleman, playfully addressing him as Your Majesty. The gentleman then proceeds to christen the baby by the name Noah. Interestingly, the baby himself becomes aware of this change as his name transitions to Noah Ararat. But when someone asks what is Noah Sama's standing, the majesty says that he is his son so of course he is a prince. He has got the aptitude for water. If it is water, then he shall be the lord of Almeria. Noah notices that his status is changing once again, and now he is being called Noah Ararat, 13th prince of the empire. His water aptitude changes to E plus S, and then it changes to SS. So everyone is shocked to see that Noah's water aptitude is already SS. They wonder if it means to say that Noah has already been awakened. As everyone praised the baby and the emperor, the emperor raised the baby in front of the crowd and called it the birth of a man of extraordinary talent. Noah thinks that at this rate, he is not a young man from a village. He is reincarnated as a nobleman. After a few years in a residence, as the kid wakes up, he is taken care of by her servants who start by changing his clothes. Noah thinks that the maids change his clothes every day when he gets out of bed in the morning, and at the age of six, he has gotten used to people seeing him naked, and it makes his heart pound. He was just a village boy. Now he is the emperor's blood, his son, a prince. He is amazed to think that he lives in the great residence of the 13th prince adjacent to the palace. He is in a position where he is the lord of Almeria home of the Water Clan. Since his six years of reincarnation, he has learned a few things. Everyone else sees the status as SS, but for him, it looks like E plus S, and apparently, this depends on the number of subordinates. Even now, there is a slight increase in the basic skills with dozens of maids, which means that if he has more subordinates, then he can be stronger than this. Prior to his reincarnation, he had a maximum of level 8, and now it changed to an infinity symbol, which seems like his growth potential is infinite. After some time, the maids tell him that his dress has been changed, and he looks very handsome as always. As he proceeds to move out of the room, the maids start talking about him. They say that Noah Sama is amazing. Normally, people his age are very mischievous, but he is always so calm and collected. They wonder if that is what they call the dignity of a ruler. So Noah goes to the dining table and starts eating as he thinks that even for a prince, there are a lot of strings attached, and he can't help it now that he is six years old. Moments later, a maid comes and informs Noah that His Imperial Highness the Crown Prince and the Fourth Prince have arrived and they said to eat slowly and then come visit. Noah gets up and orders her to lead the way immediately as he wipes his hands. Noah goes into the room where His Imperial Highness the Crown Prince and the Fourth Prince were sitting. He sits on his knees and greets them good morning. The Second Prince and Crown Prince Albert Ararat was happy to see Noah and the Fourth Prince Henry Ararat asked him not to be nervous and asked him to just have a seat. Albert Ararat compliments Noah for being as polite and wise as ever and says that he is going to be a great chancellor one day. As Henry Ararat agrees with Albert Ararat, Noah says that he will do his best to become one and asks them what brings them here today. Albert Ararat says that he has a little present for him and orders a servant to bring it in. A servant enters the room with a huge box. The server starts panting and places the box down. After he opens the box as per Albert Ararat's order, there happens to be a big sword. Noah was surprised to see the sword. Albert Ararat asks Noah to hold it as it is a present to him. After Noah picks up the sword, Albert is amazed to see that it is just as he expected. Albert Ararat says that the name of that sword is Leviathan, also known as the Demon Sword of Water, and before he was holding the sword, about 120 people died in the past. The sword almost slips out of Noah's hands. He thinks that it was dangerous as he was just about to drop the gift from the Imperial Prince. Henry Ararat tells him that he doesn't need to worry about it as the moment he cannot carry that sword, he is cursed to death as soon as he holds it. Henry says that it is a demon sword that even the S guys would handle with their lives cut short, but he was wondering what would happen to someone having SS. Noah was surprised when he realized that he let him hold it for that reason only. Albert says that most people cannot even hold the box of it, and the servant says that he feels like his whole body freezes terribly, and it hurts like a needle prick. As they leave, Albert says that he has seen some great things in his time here and apologizes for disturbing Noah in the morning. At night, when Noah is about to take a bath, he notices that his maid Zoe is zoned out. He asks her what's wrong as she doesn't look well. She asks her to forgive her, 
Before she could say anything else, Noah ordered her to just say it. Zoe says that she was wondering if she could have some time off. When Noah asks her why she wants to leave, Zoe says that her parents' farm was washed away during the early spring flood. Her mother is a single woman and can no longer afford to feed herself, so she was thinking of going to the red light district. After hearing her, Noah thinks for a while and concludes by saying that they will bring her mother to the mansion and have her policing the back gate and she will be given 10 riens a month for the job. Zoe was surprised to hear that as she had never heard of such a job and 10 riens is more money than any normal working man would make. While going for a bath, Noah says that there is an empty house on the west edge of the city and she can use that place with her mother. Zoe starts crying and bows down to Noah as she thanks him. The reason behind Noah's such actions is that if it gets out that his servant, the girl who tended to the prince, is going to the brothel to sell herself, the name of the 13th prince will be tarnished and worse, the emperor might even reprimand him for his actions. According to Noah, now that Zoe is his servant, she is going to be his servant for the rest of her life. The time to quit is either when she dies or when he kicks her out. To him, his servant quitting for a few ten riens and being sold out to the brothel is just unacceptable. After taking the bath, as Zoe wipes Noah's body with a towel, Noah calls out for Dylan and asks him if he has heard of the early spring flood at Dasso. Noah orders him to go out and buy as much land as he can as after the flood. There will be a lot of merchants who will try to wind up their crippled home, like Zoe's parents so Noah orders Dylan to go and save them before they do. Dylan became speechless after hearing this. When Noah asks him if there is any problem, Dylan says that he is just surprised as Master Noah's first time dealing with the flood. He did an excellent job of anticipating it. Noah thinks that he has seen a lot of that kind of stuff before his reincarnation. Dylan says that to do it, it will cost about 500,000 riens. Without wasting any time, Noah assures him that he will provide it and orders him to get going. As Dylan gently smiles, Noah asks if there is anything else. Dylan simply thanks him and proceeds to leave. Now that Noah comes to think of it, he remembers that Dylan is from that area too. After a few days, Noah is called out by his father. Noah goes into the emperor's office, kneels down in front of him, and asks if he wanted to see him. The emperor of the Mir's empire asks Noah how he is. In his reply, Noah says that he is very well and is trying his best every day. The emperor says that it looks like Noah has bought an entire village. Noah was surprised and wondered how he knew about it as it was only a few days ago, and he hadn't even reported it. The emperor says asks him not to look so surprised as he didn't call him to reprimand him. Rather, it is the opposite. The emperor in a conversation with Noah acknowledges that Noah was fortunate enough to be spared from the arduous task of cleaning up after the series of calamities that occurred, combining both natural and man-made disaster. Intrigued, the emperor inquires how Noah acquired this knowledge. Noah reveals that he learned of the situation through a young woman from the affected village, who happens to be employed as a maid in the residence of the 13th prince. This circumstance led to Noah hearing about her desperate intention to sell herself to a brothel due to the dire consequences brought upon by the disaster. The emperor considers it as a coincidence but also a blessing. He praises Noah and decides to give him a reward. He recalls that the 13th prince's allowance is 8,000 riens a year and thinks that it is not much for Noah. Noah, on the other hand, thinks that an average annual income for a 30-year-old in the capital is 120 riens, so it is not a small amount by any means. The emperor decides to raise his allowance by a 1,000 and appreciates his work once again. One day, Noah goes out for a walk in the most prosperous city in the land, the capital of the Empire of Myers. People, goods, and money, all things come together here. There is a wide range of things to satisfy human desires. However, Noah is aware that there is not much that he can do with a six-year-old's body. Noah remembered that the eunuchs mentioned a songstress on the market and decided to go check it out a bit. Upon his arrival at the venue, Noah recognizes the singer as Alice and is pleasantly surprised by her singing abilities. While he acknowledges that her technique is still developing, he can discern her genuine commitment and dedication towards her craft. This observation leads Noah to conclude that Alice is a conscientious and dedicated individual, taking her singing pursuits seriously. Suddenly, someone starts shouting and punching people around. He asks the girl what is she doing here singing like a little bitch. He questions her if she thinks she can pay the debts that her father made like this. Before she could say anything, the guy starts putting her clothes and says that as a girl, she has something to make money with. Before he could do anything else, Noah stops him. The guy says that he is just a kid and he should go suck his mama's titties. Noah in his reply says that according to Article 67.2 of the Imperial Code, no child shall be required to shoulder the debts of a parent. 
It is a crime to ask a daughter to pay back her father's debt by selling her body. The guy grabs Noah's clothes. As he prepares to punch Noah, Noah uses a magic tool splash. By using a magic tool, he can cast a magic spell regardless of magic power, while the effect depends on the user's attributes. The guy and his mates went through a lot of pain because of Noah's magic attack. As soon as Noah asks them if they still want to continue, they immediately run away. Everyone was impressed to see the kid taking them down. So Noah approaches the guy who got punched and tells him that if they come here again, then he can tell them to come to him. Noah hands him a card as well. When he realizes and shouts that he is the prince, everyone is shocked. Noah picks up Alice's hat and hands it over to her. He compliments her by saying that the song from earlier was good and asks her how much she earns in a month. Alice hesitantly says that considering her mother's medical bill, before she can say anything else, Noah turns around and says that he will pay her 25 riens every month so she doesn't need to worry and keep singing. He will also give her more as she gets better. Alice is surprised to hear that and thanks him. Noah also asks her to let him hear the rest of the song. At night, while returning back to his residence, Noah notices a few men bowing down in front of his residence. He realizes that one of those guys must be the boss of the guys who came for money, and they seem to know who he is. While walking down the hallway, a maid comes to Noah and asks him what to do about those men from earlier. Noah orders her to send them away as he asks her if anyone can just have an audience with the prince just because they want to. Henry Ararat comes to the scene and appreciates Noah's decision. Henry says that taking such people lightly would be a disgrace to the royalty and the king's reputation. Noah says that that's a part of it, but in actuality, he went to hear a girl named Alice sing, and these guys were there to collect her father's debt so she stepped in and got rid of that, so it would be better if they thought that he is still mad, and they would not be able to mess with Alice again. Henry is surprised to see that Noah has already thought through it. Moreover, Noah says that if they think that he has forgiven them, then they will mess with her again and Henry finds it sensible. Henry teases Noah about how good her singing was. They went into a room. After Henry sits on a royal sofa, he starts to talk about what had happened the same day. He says that there is something that he has to tell him about that demon sword Leviathan. Henry tells Noah that the demon sword has a will. It does not speak, but it definitely has one and the tricky part is that it seems to be entrenched in an awareness of hierarchy. To help Noah understand properly, Henry asks him to just think of it as a dog. Before he starts welding it, it's better to make clear who is in charge. It is better for both of them if he makes it give in. As Henry says that it is a long way off for that, Noah thinks of it deeply and asks someone to bring him that demon sword. After the servant brings in the box of the demon sword, Noah asks him to get some rest as it was hard for him. Noah then picks up the sword with both of his hands. He recalls that Henry has said that it is a long way off for it and makes up his mind to prove it now. Moments later, Henry is amazed to see that Noah has completely brought the demon sword to its knees. Henry asks someone to show him Noah's status. Just as Noah had thought, being his underling doesn't only apply to just humans and everyone expects him will see water triple S while he sees E plus SS. Henry is really amazed to see Noah's improvement at just the age of six. After Noah manages to bring the demon sword to its knees, Henry is surprised to see that only six years old and his water is at triple S and wonders if that's what happens when someone brings a demon sword to its knees. But while everyone was seeing Noah's water aptitude as triple S, he alone was able to see it as E plus SS. He recalls it as if someone brings the demon sword to its knees as expected, the water S becomes double S. But he wonders what would happen if remains as it is. Moments later, Noah says that he really wants to carry it around with him. Henry asks him to wait a few years since his majesty and his brothers are tall, he will grow soon. However, Noah realizes something and holds on to the demon sword. While Henry asks him what's the matter, Noah says that he wants to try something. As Noah holds the demon sword and concentrates, the demon sword starts to change its size. Henry is surprised to see that Noah just changed its size. Noah says that the demon sword itself taught him how to do it. Noah claims that the object was isolated and designated as a valuable possession to the nation two centuries ago. But in reality, there is no historical evidence supporting this assertion. Henry is genuinely astounded by this information and expresses his admiration towards Noah for sharing it. As a result, Noah is delighted knowing that he can now conveniently carry this object wherever he goes, which brings him great satisfaction. After some time, a maid enters the room and informs Noah that he has got an invitation from the third visor as he is hosting a banquet at his residence. Noah asks her at what time will it start. The maid replies back by saying that it was written that he can come at any time. 
Noah realizes that it means he is the guest of honor, and so the banquet will officially start when he arrives at the residence. Noah inquires about his brother Henry's intentions regarding their plans. In response, Henry expresses his aversion towards noisy environments, indicating his decision to abstain from attending the event. Noah comprehends Henry's perspective and, acknowledging the circumstances, decides to proceed with attending the banquet on his own. As they went out, the boss of the guys from earlier burst out of anger and started shouting. Noah makes his demon sword visible to them and intimidates them by just looking at them. The booze of those guys bow down once again. Henry asks Noah what did he do to him. Noah looks at Henry and excuses him. Henry is surprised to understand that the intimidation was just too much to handle. He is happy to see that Noah is getting used to this kind of stuff. After riding the horse cart to the third visor's residence, as Noah gets out of the cart, he is welcomed by the third visor, Jean Brad Radauk. Noah thanks him for having him and says that it looks like it is a pleasant evening. Jean Brad and Noah then went inside through the hallway. As soon as the servants open the doors for them, they are welcomed by all the guests inside the hall. Everyone claps their hands and talks about Noah being the 13th prince as Noah and the third visor enter the hall. Jean Brad asks Noah about the object on his waist and wonders if it was not there the last time they met. Noah tells him that this is a gift from His Highness, the crown prince known as Leviathan. Jean Brad immediately recognizes it by the name of Leviathan and recalls it as a national treasure. Everyone else is also surprised to hear that the crown prince himself gifted the 13th prince the national treasure. In the babbling in the hall, someone shouts that the demon sword is just a toy, and it is fake anyway. Noah notices it and thinks about what should he do, but suddenly everyone starts getting choked out of nowhere. It is the demon sword's power. Noah orders it to hold and everyone back to normal. The guy who called the demon sword a toy and fake runs away. Noah thinks that maybe Sit should have been more suitable. He had never thought that Leviathan would be so angry that it would release so much killing intent. Jean Brad admires Noah for being just as he had expected of his highness. He says that now everyone here equally felt death, and that is just a glimpse of the power of the national treasure and the greatness of his highness, the 13th prince that can control this overwhelming power. Everyone gets excited to hear that and finds it amazing that Noah is able to control so much power at such a young age. After Noah sits on a royal chair especially kept for him, a simple greeting to usual upper-class nobles follows after the incident. After some time, two guys come to Noah to greet him. The man greets Noah and introduces himself as Byron Allen and introduces the girl as his daughter, Cindy, and asks Noah to allow them to get acquainted. Noah asks Byron if the girl is his adopted daughter. The third visor is surprised and wonders if his highness knew about it. Noah declines and says that he just knew that by some observation. He continues by saying that the way he behaves, he has that with someone born into the upper class, but the girl she does not have that. Noah has his memory of his previous life and can see the difference in the way one carries oneself between the upper class and the lower class. Jean Brad is impressed with Noah's insight. Furthermore, Noah claims that the young girl whom Byron has taken into his care is, in fact, a girl who has been enslaved. This revelation astonishes Byron, who realizes Noah's keen powers of observation. According to Noah, it is her eyes that give away her past. There is a distinct and peculiar questioning gaze in the eyes of individuals who have experienced the horrors of enslavement. This unsettling look serves as a constant reminder of their tumultuous past, and it is this particular gaze that Noah has noticed in the girl. Byron tells Noah that he had bought this girl from a slave trader, but she was different from the others, she was smart so he decided to adopt her and teach her a lot of things. Noah is happy to hear that and says that he likes that kind of thing. He also says that next time he will invite him to his mansion as he wants to hear more about the girl. Byron is pleased to hear that. Everyone finds it impressive that Noah saw right through it. Noah says that there is also one more reason why he knew she was not his biological daughter. He says that the way she reacted to his intimidation was she stood up in front of Brian to protect him when he used intimidation earlier. A girl of her age is usually the one being protected so he understood that the girl is not his biological daughter. Jean Brad is truly impressive to know that Noah saw through it from the start, and he sure has a wide thought range. On the following day, as Noah enjoys a cup of tea in his yard, his maid Zoe approaches him and informs him about a gesture of appreciation from the third vizier. She raises the question of how Noah intends to respond to this token of gratitude. Zoe also highlights the significance of expressing thanks for attending the party, as it plays a crucial role in maintaining aristocratic relationships. In response, Noah advises Zoe to handle the situation in the usual manner by accepting the token graciously. Noah then thinks that he has made the demon sword succumb to him, and it would not be good to just rely on intimidation, he thinks that he needs to be able to wield the sword itself, otherwise it won't look good. 
The sword shines up a bit, and Noah says understands that the demon sword is also excited. Unknowingly, Zoe asks what is to be excited about. He says that he just thought of something exciting and proceeds to go out. Zoe follows him while wondering what could be something interesting. Noah asks her to just wait and watch. Noah stands in front of a huge tree. Noah knows that his strength and speed are E or F, so he cannot cut down a tree with those. However, Noah manages to cut down the tree with the demon sword. Zoe is surprised to see that Noah managed to cut such a big tress effortlessly. Noah says that you cannot do that with just strength. Noah realizes that these are the movements of Leviathan's former owners, and by tracing that, he was able to cut the huge tree. The demon sword itself had told that to Noah. Noah thinks that this will make him look good for a while. Suddenly, Noah sounds surprised. When Zoe asks him what is it this time, he shows her a magic tool and asks her if she knows what it is. She answers him by saying that it is a magic tool known as Splash used for activating magic. Then Noah tells her that it seems like his demon sword could do the same thing as it. It won't consume magic power, but it can only be used once an hour. Noah then decides to give it a shot. As Noah prepares to cut the remaining tree into two, Zoe is happy to see that her master is unusually excited. When Noah makes the attack, he realizes something and acts immediately. His attack creates a huge hole, and both Zoe and Noah are surprised to see it. Noah was able to change its course, but the bottom could not be seen at all, and Noah finds the attack of the demon sword dangerous. But while taking a bath, Zoe says that with the training Noah just did, his body is covered with dust. Another maid asks him if there is anything else that needs to be washed. Noah replies to her by saying that he is fine. While the maids are wiping Noah's body with towels, a maid comes in and informs him that the governor of Haojoy, Murray, has come to visit him. After getting ready, when Noah goes to meet Murray, he recalls him as an upstart from his domain. Murray bows down in front of Noah and introduces himself as Murray Detto and calls it an honor to see him in person. Noah asks him not to be so formal and offers him a seat. Noah recalls that this is the second time that they have met each other. Murray adds to it by saying that about a year and a half ago, when his majesty ordered him to be the governor, he greeted his highness. Noah recalls that Murray was ordered by his majesty to help control the water in Haojoy. Murray agrees with Noah, but with a sad expression which gets noticed by Noah. It's a place called Haojoy. It is a land that is situated at the corner of a great river. As a result, the land is fertile as a granary, but occasionally there are great floods that cause great disasters. The idea was to completely eliminate the problem and make the area a stable granary. The governor was appointed for that reason Murray from Almeria, home of the Water Clan. Noah wonders if it is not going well. Murray tells him that the budget was not coming down and they could not afford to wear a sleeve. When Noah asks him why wouldn't it be as it is an order from his majesty, Murray says that the Ministry of Finance has all sorts of reasons. After hearing this, Noah gets up and orders Murray to follow him. Noah went to meet the Ministry of Finance Maybrick with Murray. Maybrick says that he did not expect to see Noah so suddenly. Noah tells him that Murray had already told him about it and that the Ministry of Finance is reluctant to give the budget. Maybrick disagrees with him and says that there is a deeper reason for that matter. Noah says that if he is going to tell him that he does not understand anything just because he is a kid, then he should shut his mouth right away. Maybrick, with a fake smile, says that of course he won't do that kind of disrespect. So Noah forced him to explain. Maybrick says that last year how joy was flooded again. Noah confirms it from Murray, who then nods to clarify. When Noah asks Maybrick what about it, he says that at that time, his majesty had issued a royal decree exempting the Haojoy from taxes for a whole year. Murray already knew what he was going to talk about. Maybrick says that in other words, there is a tax slush fund that is up for grabs and they can spend it, in the view of the Ministry of Finance. In his response, Noah says rudely that the emperor exempted the tax because they were flooded and considers the reason to be just because there was no tax they could collect. Maybrick and Murray were surprised to see how Noah turned the tables. However, Maybrick still insists by saying that that was not what he meant and says that he can't tell the actual reason right now. Noah still kept on questioning him. Maybrick asks Noah if he is aware of all the talk about building a new summer resort for his majesty. Noah recalls it and says that your majesty is quite old, so he is talking about the building of a summer villa in the north of the capital which gets hot every year. Maybrick says that even though it is a villa, it is for his majesty's use, and it is the same with the detached palace. Murray was frustrated to hear Maybrick talk about his majesty. Maybrick continues to say that in short, it is a villa. It is a city of about 5,000 people, and it will cost a lot of money and concludes by saying that for that reason, the treasury is running low. Noah orders him to shut up and considers that as a big disrespect. Noah considers Maybrick's reason as if he is trying to make his father a fool of him. Noah does not let Maybrick say anything. Noah questions Maybrick that the flooded areas need flood control. 
but they cannot afford it now because they are building vacation homes and says that what he is saying is what makes his majesty a fool. Maybrick starts crying as he calls it a misunderstanding. He gets on his knees and asks Noah for forgiveness. Noah warns him to either give them the money, or he will go tell this to his majesty. Maybrick does not waste any time and decides to get a budget for Howjoy right away, and considers it as their top priority. Murray is surprised to see that without moving even one step. Noah made the Ministry of Finance surrender. Murray tells Noah that he admires him for a great negotiating push and skillful words that took advantage of the other party's weaknesses and missteps. Murray feels ashamed of his own shallowness in asking His Highness for this position. Noah realizes that Murray thought that the prince himself was planning to forcibly have his own way to this matter. Murray thanks him by bowing down to him. As they go out, Murray understands that he needs to return as soon as possible to push forward with the flood control. Moments later, someone approaches Noah and says that he wishes to address Your Highness the 13th. He says that High Majesty wishes to see him and asks him to report to him on his way. Noah wonders what could it be. After reaching His Majesty's palace, Noah finds his father in the garden where he is feeding birds. Noah goes to him and bows down as he says that he has come in response to His Majesty's summons. His Majesty asks him to make himself comfortable, and he starts by appreciating Noah's work and thanks him. Noah is confused to hear that and wonders what it is about. His Majesty tells him that this is about how Joy, and he had heard that he smashed Maybrick. Noah is surprised because that just happened earlier, and he had just gotten out of the finance ministry. His Majesty continues by saying that information is weapon, and you should get in the habit of constantly polishing it. His Majesty appreciates Noah once again. Noah says that he just did the obvious thing, but His Majesty tells him that it is not always easy as many people have good mouths, and some use their sycophants, but there are only a few who can do the obvious thing. High Majesty goes toward Noah. He puts his hand on Noah's head and says that he is only six years old, but he is really amazing. His Majesty notices the demon sword on Noah's waist and compliments him once again for being in complete control of that demon sword Leviathan. His Majesty decides that Noah needs to get a master of swordsmanship and calls out for Noble. After some time, Nobel comes to His Majesty and introduces himself as Damien Noble. His Majesty asks him to teach Noah how to use a sword. Noble agrees to do his best for it. His Majesty tells Noah that Noble's swordsmanship is top in the empire, and he is claimed to be unmatched in swordplay. Noah is excited to learn swordsmanship from Noble. Noble decides to get right into it and unsheathes his sword to see what Noah has to offer. His Majesty reminds Noble that Noah is just a child who has not been taught anything yet. Noble assures His Majesty by saying that he is only looking at his qualities and not his skills. Noble says to Noah that he is not sure how he managed to convince His Majesty so easily and considers it as proof of how trustworthy he actually is. Noah prepares himself as he draws out the demon sword. Noble asks him to come slashing at him from anywhere. 